To see one of the most significant astronomical events of all time, we go to South America. In the Atacama Desert, Chile, we find the most advanced technology for space observation. Here, the Royal Astronomical Community members watched for six months as a black hole simply absorbed a massive star. By the way, these are the same scientists who prove that in the center of our Milky Way galaxy is a supermassive black hole, and even took a photo of it. For the first time in history, this incredible event happened very close to Earth. Well, the distance of 215 million light years is considered quite close in astronomy terms anyway. Light from this event reached our planet in September of 2019, and even the most experienced scientists dropped their jaws in surprise. Imagine a star the size of our Sun, about 860,000 miles wide. Such stars have enough weight to create a strong gravitational field, holding many planets in their orbit. And now, let's place a giant black hole next to it. The hole is absolutely black, shaped like a disk, and weighs a billion times more than this star. The force of its gravitational field is incredible. Nothing can leave its gravity force. Objects that can move at the speed of light will still fall into this black abyss. Even light itself cannot escape its boundaries. As soon as a star enters the gravitational field of a black hole, it has no chance. At first, it tries to resist the pull of the black hole. Still, the star's outer layers begin to stretch toward the black hole, just like spaghetti. This is due to a powerful force of attraction. If you had the opportunity to extend your hand toward the black hole, hmm. you would see your fingers begin to stretch and elongate. This is because the force of attraction increases with every inch. Therefore, it acts stronger on your fingers than on your arm. That's why this process of pulling objects into a black hole is called spaghettification. The first thing to be sucked into the black hole is the star's crown. This is the outer shell of the star, which consists of hot plasma. You may notice how the star begins to shrink in size. This is because that plasma makes up most of the visible sun. When this hot plasma spaghetti reaches the black hole, it may appear to remain on the disk's edge and continue to orbit the black hole. But, in fact, there is no turning back anymore. The star's particles have already hit the event horizon of the dark abyss. The gravitational field of a black hole bends light around its edges, so the event horizon looks a bit like a croissant for the observer. Boy, lots of food metaphors here. I'm getting hungry. You may also notice a kind of chaos in this ring, as if some light particles are moving in one direction and others in another. This happens because of a mirror effect. But you can be sure that whatever reaches the event horizon will, sooner or later, be pulled into the singularity, or the black pearl of the black hole. Another illusion you spot is the star particles in the event horizon moving slower. The truth is that supermassive objects like a black hole curve space-time around them. And the more massive the object, the slower time flows near it. If you hang one watch beside a black hole and another on a wall in your bedroom, you will see that the second hand in the first watch barely moves, while a whole day passes on Earth. As observers, it seems to us that the particles of light have slowed their movement. But in fact, they may have already been absorbed by the black hole ages ago. Now, massive streams of red-hot plasma splash into space, just like spaghetti sauce. <laughs> when a black hole has absorbed star material, it emits powerful rays of energy at a rate of about 6,200 miles per second. This release of energy is accompanied by an intense flash. It's thanks to this flash that scientists can even detect this process in the first place. This phenomenon can be observed when a supernova explodes. When nothing remains of the star's body, we can still see stardust and other particles in the black hole's event horizon. Kind of like the Parmesan cheese sprinkled on the spaghetti. Hey, stop me if I'm taking this too far. When the process of spaghettification is completed, about half of the star's weight has been thrown into outer space as dust and glowing particles. The other half was entirely absorbed by the black hole. 
The scientists observed this process for almost six months. But what would be more interesting is to dive into a black hole yourself. Well, we can't do that yet, but we can simulate this process. Here's a little drone, our metal friend, kind of like a meatball. No, I haven't had lunch yet. Right now, it's at a safe distance from the black hole, the length of about three widths of the event horizon. Objects at this distance can orbit the black hole safely. A little closer, and it'll be swallowed up by a dark infinity. So our destroyed star could have safely existed at this distance. Moreover, planets can live at this distance. And if there is a suitable source of light and heat somewhere nearby, life can exist on these planets too. But our goal is the singularity, and we guide the meatball, I mean the drone, closer to the event horizon. After a few minutes, the force of attraction begins to strengthen, and the drone starts to stretch like spaghetti. When it begins spinning around the black disk, it means it has reached the event horizon and has started its descent into the black abyss. Now, let's look at everything from the drone's perspective. All the light from the stars that it sees becomes blue. This is called gravitational blue shift. As it falls into the black hole, its gravitational field pulls the photons of light down, giving them energy. Their wavelengths grow shorter, so the red photons change into blue. The drone continues to fall and is already completely hidden from our eyes. And all that the robot sees is a bright, thin blue beam. Now it's in complete darkness. There's absolutely nothing here, not even time. Here, time goes so slowly that our entire solar system could grow old and cease to exist during a minute spent in a black hole. But our drone will live until its battery is empty. Hey, the drone sees a small bundle of light again, and it's getting closer and more prominent. Now the drone will experience the same fall, only in reverse. Once the drone leaves the singularity, the heart of the black hole, it will be on the event horizon once again. The light from the stars gradually changes from blue to red. Then the drone is thrown into outer space, perhaps in some faraway galaxy. Well, returning from a black hole is just a theory. Some people think that black holes are a kind of wormhole that can lead us to distant places in space. But so far, these theories are considered fiction. Black holes are quite challenging to detect. The problem is, they are, well, black, just like space. They don't emit light like stars, so they can only be detected by gravity anomalies. Despite this, scientists believe there are a vast numbers of black holes in our universe. They're born when a massive star collapses under its own weight. And given the infinite number of stars in the universe, black holes are probably a common phenomenon. Scientists believe black holes have their own lifetimes. This is because of Hawking radiation. A black hole loses mass, and so, to continue existing, it has to absorb massive objects, like the star we just watched. But if the black hole lives in deep space, it has less to absorb and will most likely begin to shrink until it just disappears. Like this plate of spaghetti. Mm. Imagine leaving your house one morning and seeing not one, but two stars shining in the sky. The first one is our good old sun, and the other is Jupiter. But how has a planet turned into a star? And what will now happen to Earth and its inhabitants? Before we find the answer to these urgent questions, we need to revise some things we know about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system is a gas giant, which means it's made up mostly of gases. Due to the pressure and temperature differences, these gases separate into layers. This creates those red and white bands that can be clearly seen from Earth. The temperatures at the top of Jupiter's atmosphere are insane. They can reach a whopping 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet also has an immense gravitational pull. In 1995, the Galileo probe reached the atmosphere of Jupiter and sliced it at a speed of 106,000 miles per hour. It survived the scorching temperatures and started its descent. It kept moving even when the temperature suddenly dropped and the pressure, as well as the speed of the wind, increased. But 58 minutes and 97 miles into its exploration, things went downhill. 
the pressure of 23 atmospheres, and still high temperatures, finished the probe off. It was melted and then vaporized by the extreme heat. Now, if Jupiter suddenly decided to keep growing, it would eventually become a star, and its composition would allow this planet to do it. Once, a long, long time ago, Jupiter took most of the mass that was left after the formation of our Sun. That's how it ended up with more than twice the combined material of all other bodies in the solar system. And the planet's ingredients are the same as those of a star, mostly hydrogen and helium. Jupiter is just not massive enough to ignite. But what if it was? Then it would turn into another kind of celestial body, most likely a brown dwarf. In this case, it would have a minor effect on the orbits of the planets of our solar system, because brown dwarfs are more massive than planets, but not as massive as stars. A brown dwarf is usually 13 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter. It can only become a star if the pressure in its core gets high enough to start nuclear fusion. So let's imagine that it's happened, and Jupiter has become a real star. For example, a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars with masses around 7.5% to 50% of the mass of our Sun. Red dwarfs are also hotter than brown dwarfs. Their temperature can reach 6,380 degrees Fahrenheit. Our Sun, by comparison, has a temperature of almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it means that the newly formed red dwarf will be far dimmer than the Sun. And still, Red dwarf Jupiter could prevent the inner planets from following their orbits, because they wouldn't be able to find a balance between the gravitational forces of the two stars. The planets would move either closer to the Sun or closer to the newly formed red dwarf. If Earth chose the first option, our main star's insane temperatures would probably wipe all living beings off the face of the Earth in no time. If it was the second scenario, we'd probably freeze, since Jupiter, as a dim red dwarf, wouldn't be able to warm us up well enough. But there could be one more option. The inner planets could get thrown out of the solar system altogether. If Jupiter was a star, it would also greatly increase the amount of radiation the surface of Earth would receive. Our atmosphere would have to protect us both from the radiation coming from the Sun and from Jupiter's radiation. Red dwarfs are notoriously active. That's why Jupiter, just like the Sun, would most likely have frequent coronal mass ejections. This is a fancy expression for describing large clouds of electrically charged particles a star releases with a huge burst of speed. Even now, Jupiter has a significant impact on our planet. The gas giant is roughly 318 times as massive as Earth. And this also means it has an outsized pull on our planet. Its gravity can cause shifts in the orbit of our planet and climate swings every 400,000 years or so. When Jupiter's influence is the strongest, Earth usually has colder winters, hotter summers, and more intense periods of wetness and droughts. Also, if Jupiter turned into a red dwarf, its most prominent feature might probably disappear for good. I'm talking about the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts tower more than five miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is almost twice as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the Red Spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. They were higher than the temperature of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. 
but the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear altogether. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. And now, I have another what-if situation for you. What if Jupiter collided with the smallest star we know about? Today, these two space bodies are on a collision course. A spoiler, Earth might not survive such an encounter. Okay, meet this tiny red dwarf. It's the size of Saturn, and its gravity is around 300 times the gravity of our planet. It normally floats 600 light years away from Earth in a double star system. But today, for some inexplicable reason, it's broken all the laws of the universe and is rushing toward the biggest gas giant in our solar system. And even though this space guest is smaller than Jupiter, its mass is way greater, and its gravitational force soon starts to pull on the gas giant. The heat from the red dwarf, plus its powerful gravity, makes Jupiter grow in size. The planet's atmosphere starts to puff up because the gases that make up the planet begin to heat up and expand. Jupiter's atmosphere starts to leak into space toward the stellar visitor. Sometime later, the runaway gases form a bright hot ring around the red dwarf. This is a terrifying view, as if a black hole, a very bright one, has appeared inside the solar system. The star keeps tearing Jupiter apart, eating chunks of the gas giant. And soon, the red dwarf engulfs it completely. Sadly, Jupiter never stood a chance. Instead of the gas giant, we now have a red dwarf surrounded by a ring of hot gases. And we already know how badly it may end. The best thing about it is that this scenario is totally imaginary. Phew, thank goodness. Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years, to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom, if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century, but modern studies of Eta Carini estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our Sun. Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carine releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way, Eta Carine is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carini is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carini experienced a nova-like explosion. It increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, Eta Carini was the second brightest visible star after Sirius the dog star. And Sirius is only about 8 light years away. Since 1863, aside from a couple of flare-ups, Eta Carini has dimmed back down to its original brightness at magnitude 4.5.
Now, astronomers owe us a small apology, which we don't expect to get anytime soon, for star magnitude nomenclature. The brighter a star is, or planet, or moon, the lower its magnitude. Thus, stars brighter than first magnitude are either zero magnitude or negative magnitude. The full moon, for example, is magnitude negative 13. A magnitude positive 4.5 star, like Eta Carini, is quite dim as seen from Earth. But it's clearly visible in a night sky without light pollution or clouds if you live anywhere south of the latitude of Cairo, Egypt. 30 degrees north latitude is the farthest north you can see this star. Now, listen up. Eta Carinae is currently up to something. It's been brightening again and is now brighter than at any time since 1864. It's a complex situation. Eta Carinae is really two stars. Eta Carinae A and Eta Carinae, hmm, what's your guess? Oh, B. There's a third star nearby that's also interacting with the double star's dynamics. Now, without looking, I'm guessing it's named Eta Carinae C. Good guess. Blown out into two incredibly massive globes of gas that are expanding at 20 million miles per hour, Eta Carinae is, without a doubt, one of the strangest looking stars you'll ever see. Remember, it's located at a great distance of 7,500 light years away from us. And if anything had happened to Eta Carinae in the last 7,500 years, like going hypernova, we wouldn't be able to see it. Because none of Eta Carinae's electromagnetic radiation would have gotten here yet. Astronomers are keeping a close watch on Eta Carinae because it can go hypernova at any time. Or maybe it already did 5,000 years ago. In which case, we'd only have to wait another 2,500 years to see it. Yeah, like I'll put it in my planner. Now, from a list of over 30 likely candidate stars that might go supernova, Rho Cassiopeiae is many astronomers' choice. Another Greek letter, Rho, is the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. It means that Rho Cassiopeiae is the star with the 17th brightest apparent magnitude in the constellation Cassiopeia. Yet Rho Cass, a nickname, is only one of seven known yellow hypergiant stars in the Milky Way. It's another whopper. To be seen at magnitude 4.5 from a distance of about 10,000 light years away, Rho Cass must be a very large star, a hypergiant. Place where the Sun is, Rho Cass would encompass the orbit of Mars. But it's still yellow. It's not a red giant star. Red indicates a cooler surface temperature. Rho Cass, as huge as it is, is still as hot on its surface as our Sun, or even a little hotter. That can only mean two things. Deep inside its core, Rho Cass is fusing atoms much heavier than hydrogen or helium. Plus, Rho Cass is producing much more energy than a red giant star. In the year 2000, Rho Cass erupted massively. It brightened by two orders of magnitude as it ejected 10,000 times the mass of Earth into space at four times the speed of sound. Astronomers detected the signature of titanium oxide in this eruption. This means that Rho Cass is much closer to going supernova or in this particular case, hypernova, than astronomers used to assume. Iron is just a few steps above titanium in the periodic table. And when iron forms, fusion stops and a star collapses. Rho Cass is really close. Or, more correctly, was really close. Because the eruption we saw in the year 2000 really happened 10,000 years before. Many astronomers think Rho Cass has already gone hypernova, formed a black hole, and doesn't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse caught everyone's attention not so long ago. The star, not the movie. It dimmed dramatically, appearing only 37% as bright as it usually is. Is it getting ready to go supernova? Betelgeuse is by far the brightest star in the whole sky, in infrared light. This is an important fact because it relates to Betelgeuse's status as a supernova candidate, as we shall soon see. Betelgeuse is also named Alpha Orionis, another Greek letter designation. So we should conclude that Betelgeuse is the brightest star in Orion, right? Wrong. It's the second brightest star in its constellation. Rigel, or Beta Orionis, is the brightest one in that region. Yeah, figure that one out. It may be because Betelgeuse is classified as a semi-regular variable star, which sounds kind of redundant to me. Its approximately 400-day cycle of pulsation changes its brightness by about one full magnitude, 
going from much brighter than a first magnitude star to closer to a second magnitude star. But never was Betelgeuse observed to dim so rapidly or so drastically as it did recently. So what's going on with it? Well, from late 2019 to mid-2020, Betelgeuse went through a period of substantial dimming during a mass ejection event. The world astronomy community jumped on the situation, and in the course of their investigations, they came up with some surprising new factual data on Betelgeuse. First, Betelgeuse is not as far away as we once thought. The new, more accurate distance for Betelgeuse is 548 light-years. That's 25% closer than previously measured. The second new fact, Betelgeuse's diameter has been reduced by the same percentage. The star is now known to be 25% smaller than previously believed. The cause of Betelgeuse's dramatic dimming was also determined. The giant star ejected a cloud of gas that contained magnesium. The cloud blocked a large portion of the light coming from Betelgeuse and made it appear visually much dimmer than it really was. Magnesium is not halfway to iron on the periodic table, which means Betelgeuse is not as far along on the path to a supernova as was suspected previously. When iron starts forming in a star, it means that this star is close to shutting down its fusion reactions. The next step is implosion. We aren't quite there yet with Betelgeuse. This star emits most of its energy as infrared light, and it also indicates that its core is most probably still burning helium, and not something that would greatly increase the amount of heat, like carbon for instance. Betelgeuse will still go supernova, but not for another 100,000 years. So you can cross it off your supernova list for the time being. And as for how to correctly pronounce Betelgeuse, you can say it any way you like. There are as many different pronunciations out there as there are people who think they know how to pronounce it correctly. Now, Supernova 1987A caught astronomers off guard when it lit up the large Magellanic Cloud 100,000 plus light years away from the Milky Way. That's when attention was turned to a similar star much closer to Earth, Rigel, in the constellation of Orion. Could Rigel surprise us and suddenly go supernova? There's something called the supernova problem that you should, you know, probably know about because it may relate to Rigel going supernova or not. It seems that stars over 17 solar masses don't always go supernova. Recently, a red giant star simply vanished. Once again, it didn't go supernova, it disappeared. This had often been happening in computer simulations of supernova, and now it finally occurred in real life. Rigel's mass is 21 solar masses. In other words, it's 21 times more massive than our Sun. So, will Rigel go supernova or simply vanish into a black hole that it'll create in its core? Astronomers and physicists continue their work of learning more about the dynamics of massive stars, scouring the sky for the next supernova in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, we can rest confident that we on Earth are in no danger from the harmful effects of nearby supernova explosions. We live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, stellar neighborhood. Except for those Martians next door.